Hi, thanks for joining us this week on Menlo Church Online. We are a place where everyone's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything is possible. We are a community of people who believe in God and truly believe that he will do things in the Bay Area. So our hope this week is that you would be able to connect with him and hear what God has to tell you. So enjoy the rest of this message. Well, welcome to Menlo Church and a warm hello to all of our campuses. I'm so glad to be here to close out this series that we've been in called The Way, How to Follow Jesus for a Lifetime. And we're going to end the series the same way that we've begun. So I'm going to introduce myself. And after I introduce myself, I want you to give me a hi, Nicole, with all the warmth and generosity of sunny California. So here we go. Hi, my name is Nicole, and I am a sinner. Fabulous. I want to confess a particular sin tonight, if that's okay with you. Um, I am a hoarder. I'm not the kind of hoarder that you would see on TV. In fact, we like to keep our house nice and tidy. But I'm a hoarder of my time, sometimes of my talent, of my energy, of my relational engagement. Sometimes I find that I want to keep that stuff for myself for all kinds of reasons, which is why I'm glad to bring you this message tonight because it has brought me such great joy to prepare it about what generosity means for us and why it really is the culmination of our faith that we are people who give ourselves away for the good of others. This is the final step in the 12-step program that we've been talking about this series. To keep it, you must give it away. So let's talk about what it is and why we would want to give it away. In this series, we've talked about me steps, right? Things like prayer and study. We've talked about we steps, like what it means to be in community and accountability and dealing with trials. And in a lot of ways, this is the all step. This is actually the way that we show up in the world in the life that God has given us, that God has actually called us to a very specific way of living that involves truly giving ourselves away. So what is it that we are giving away? It's actually our very life. And how do we even know what that looks like and is? It's one of those things that Jesus spoke about in all four Gospels. There's just a few things that are mentioned in all four Gospels. In all four Gospels, Jesus says, follow me. In all four Gospels, he says, don't be afraid. In all four Gospels, he institutes communion. He foretells his death and resurrection. And in all four Gospels, he gives this message that the idea is that we lose our lives in order to keep ourselves, that this is the way that we actually have true living in Christ. Luke chapter 9, verses 24 and 25 says this. Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? This idea that to keep it, we have to give it away actually is, stands in complete opposition to our culture that specifically says to keep it, you need to keep it. In math, this is called a zero-sum game. The idea is that if I give you some, I will have less. We are very familiar with zero-sum situations. Cake is a zero-sum situation. Like, if I give you more, I will have less. Monopoly is a zero-sum situation. Somebody is going to win, and everybody else is going to go bankrupt. Soccer is a zero-sum situation. Someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. It's also zero-sum if you're a mom who doesn't really like soccer, and you have many children who play it. Zero-sum games are around this idea of a scarcity mindset. If you were here last week, you heard Steve Carter talk about the illustration of his tiny orange juice glass at the breakfast table, like trying to make that last. And in some ways, this is as if we're saying we have this tiny orange juice glass, but you have to share it with everybody, that God is calling us to something that almost seems impossible because how is generosity a positive-sum game as opposed to the zero-sum game of a life that says to keep it, you have to keep it. 
Because generosity says that everybody wins when you're generous. And in fact, I think we all agree with this already. I think we're all inspired by the idea that when we're good for others, it's really contagious and we all want to be that. I love this example from an Airbnb account. In this example, there's a guy, he's an Argentinian writer named Hernan Casquieri, and he was staying at an Airbnb in Uruguay, and he suffered a heart attack. His, his Airbnb hosts, named Javier and Alejandra, they were the first responders. They arranged for a police escort to the hospital. They stayed with him during his surgery. They donated their own blood on his behalf. And after his recovery, he wrote a five-star review, and I'm going to quote it for you. Excellent house for sedentary travelers prone to myocardial infarctions. The area is beautiful and has direct access to the best hospitals. Javier and Alejandra instantly become guardian angels who will save your life without even knowing you. They will rush you to the hospital in their own car while you're dying and stay in the waiting room while doctors give you a bypass. They don't want you to feel lonely, so they'll bring you books to read, and they'll even let you stay in their house extra nights without charging you. Highly recommend. We all think that's great, right? And in a lot of ways, I think that's all who we think we really are. Because generosity is something that is actually celebrated in our culture, I think we, most of us just think we are pretty generous. But we can be prone to deception when something that is seemed to be good, we think we are. And we can believe that it's true for us. But in reality, I think that we choose not to be generous all the time. Sometimes it's just hard to tell. Have you ever been in the grocery store and you watch and you're sort of doing word problems in your head thinking, that woman's going 15 feet a second, she's got 26 items in her basket, I think if I head on this trajectory, I can cut her off. Have you ever been in a merge in traffic and thought, like, why isn't the zipper merge working and you just take it upon yourself to be the person who says, I'm going to make sure that everyone merges properly? Have you ever found yourself in an Uber or a Lyft and you thought, today's not a day that I really want to talk to this person? If you've ever had any of those experiences, you've had that moment where you hoard a treasure of your own. And I think we can all relate to that being true, but yet, but yet, there's something so beautiful about generosity, something that we are called to that is above and beyond what we think that we can offer, that does something in us that absolutely changes the way we show up for the world. Jesus says that to keep our lives, we have to lose them. So what is it that we need to keep? And what would it look like to give, it, give something away? So we're going to go over three things to, today that talk about that. The first is this. To keep our well-being, we have to give away our treasures. And this is a very interesting idea. To keep our health, to keep our wholeness, to keep our well-being, we actually have to give away what we have. Matthew 6 says this. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our treasure isn't just money. It can be time, talent, resources, energy, the way we engage with others. In this passage, notice that the problem is not the fact that you have treasure, it's what you do with the treasure that matters. And in the economy of God, the way we give away our treasure is a positive sum game. It's a win-win for everyone. In a recent study, it was found that spending money on other people can be as effective at lowering your blood pressure as exercise or medication. In the study, researchers found it didn't matter actually how much was spent. It was simply the act of deciding to do good on behalf of others that created a sense of well-being on the part of those who were giving. Refreshing others is contagious. In fact, giving is actually getting. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will they themselves be refreshed. About 10 years ago, my husband and I, our kids were super little, all under the age of six, three kids, and we were just in a season of busyness, both of us working. And because my parents move around, I'm an army brat, so no one's ever like at home. Our home had kind of become the homestead, which meant that it was Thanksgiving, and I had 12 relatives coming to stay with me. And the problem is not actually the Thanksgiving meal. It's the 16 other meals that you have to serve when people stay with you. And I remember just feeling overwhelmed about this. And obviously, we had resources and, and things that we could have used to make it easier 
here, but I just, I remember complaining to a friend, and at one point I came home, and there was a pamphlet sitting on the front stoop of my house, and I went to open it, and I looked in it, and it was actually from a gourmet food market in my neighborhood, and there was a Thanksgiving meal circled with a big black Sharpie marker, and it said, this is being delivered to your house on Wednesday. And it was our small group leaders, we were in a married couples group, and our small group leaders had just decided to provide the whole Thanksgiving meal for us. Now, it wasn't because we needed it. This wasn't an act of mercy in the sense of like, oh, we, we, someone has to do this for us. It was actually just an act of generosity. It was just an incredibly generous move on the part of those who had led us and understood what it was like to be in that situation. And Dave and I look back on that time and we realize it, that is a moment that changed the way that we engaged with generosity from that moment forward. So fast forward 10 years, now we're the leaders of that young married group, and because of that experience with our friends, we had decided that we wanted to take each of the couples out for a really nice dinner at least once during the year, just, for that, just because, just to, just to treat them, just to be generous with them. And so we invited the first ones out, and we were out at this restaurant, we had made reservations, and we were finishing up the meal, and we had had appetizers and the whole bit. It was this great night, and we're finishing up the meal, and we're waiting for the check, and the waiter comes and says, your check has been paid for. Our same friends found out where we were and paid for that meal as well. It's like we could not outgive our friends. At that point, we said, hey, guys, we're going on vacation. Do you want to pay for that? I mean, but what <laughs> happened, what was incredible is you just, we sort of like were trying to outgive each other because this idea that we're refreshed when we refresh others that actually what God has designed for us when he says, in order to keep it, you have to give it away, if you want to keep your well-being, science is telling us that to keep your well-being, you give it away. To manage your anxiety, you're generous. To experience a well-lived life, you're generous. You do it even when you don't feel like it, and when you do it, something changes inside of us. Generosity is a powerful antidote to anxiety. It activates areas of the brain that release oxytocin, this powerful feel-good chemical. God has wired us to be refreshed by refreshing others. A wonderful diagnostic for our faith can be asking the question, am I experiencing well-being in my life? When I'm in my work and my life, when I think about it, do I feel like I'm living well? And if not, is there just an act of generosity that I need to express? Not because it needs to be big, not because it has to be perfect, but just because God has said that, hey, when you do that, there's gonna be a refreshment that comes to you that actually rewires the way that you're experiencing the world. To keep our well-being, we have to give away our treasure. Secondly, to keep our focus, we have to give away our faith. This is the culmination of our faith in Christ. Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection two things. The first he said is he said, go and make disciples. And what that meant was go and teach people how to live into the lifestyle of Jesus. The second thing he said is, and you will be my witnesses. So what he said was you're actually gonna live out what you've experienced and by talking about what you've experienced firsthand, that is going to advance the gospel. The way people will know about me is not your doctrine, not your rules, but because you're a person who teaches others about the lifestyle of Jesus and because you're a person who shows up and with a firsthand experience knows and understands a life with Jesus Christ. We're called to be these kind of people who give away our faith. Our faith changes everything about us. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Listen to this incredibly powerful truth. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Since what needs to be done has been done. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When we give away our lives to Christ, that first step of surrender, we now have a new location. Our souls are now existing in a new location. We have been raised with Christ. We are hidden and secure in Christ. Our hearts can now be set on heavenly things because the things that we strive for, the things that we fear, the ways that we wish that we would belong, that has already been done. You have already been raised with Christ. Our hearts and our souls have been located into a new place. And because of that, 
We need to keep our focus on heavenly things while our feet are still on earth. We have a new location for our souls. Philippians 1.27 says this, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. We've given our lives over to Christ, and we also now have a new citizenship. Our location is in a new place. Our citizenship is in a new place. When we show up for the world, we're showing up as an ambassador of Christ, just like a a little embassy everywhere we go. Because I don't live as the world lives. I actually have a different calling. I have a calling that's an all calling. To keep it, you have to give it away. To keep the focus on the heavenly things, you have to be giving it away. I love in Acts chapter 4, Peter has just experienced the resurrected Christ. Peter goes from this guy, if you know him in the, in the Gospels, he's fearful, he's impulsive. He turns away from Jesus in his time of need. But after Jesus restores him, when he's been risen, Peter suddenly becomes fearless and courageous, and he just speaks boldly and openly. And one of these first times that we see Peter talking like this is in Acts chapter 4, and he begins to explain to the people listening who Jesus is and why everything is different because of Jesus and why he's surrendered to this Jesus. And they, and they tell him to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter and John say this, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This idea is that like when Jesus gets a hold of you, you just can't help but speak about it. Rick Warren says you naturally evangelize anything that you love. It just becomes part of who you are. 1 Peter 3.15 says always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You know what that says? It means that people are going to notice that you have hope. (laughs) That's the first step. Before we would ever have a chance to speak about our faith, we would have people who'd be noticing that we have a different citizenship and a different location for our souls, that we live different. People would see something in our presence, in our lifestyle, in our actions that would give them reason to notice that we have hope. A sacrament we talk about in the church that Jesus institutes, the way we've described sacraments is an outward sign of an inward reality. I think generosity is an outward sign of an inward reality, but here's what's even more true. Generosity is also an outward reality that becomes an inward sign. It works both ways. We show up for generosity as an overflow for what God has done for us, but also when we just choose to be generous, when we don't feel like it, something happens inwardly as well. It goes both ways. How interesting that God has provided us an outward behavior that not only rewards us, but it keeps us from detrimental thinking. The compassion part of your brain cannot be lit up as, at the same time as the anger part of your brain. When you commit yourself to generosity, you're actually becoming more well. This might be the most literal discovery of what it actually means that we must lose our life, our treasures, in order to keep ourself. The good news is because we are image bearers of God, we have the DNA of generosity within us. I remember when one of my kids was little, they had a pacifier, and probably nine months old, they just wanted you to have it too. Have you ever had a kid who just want, they want to share what they have? I'm like, thank you, but no thank you. But the spirit of that DNA that we've been given, that when we love something, we want to give it away. When we have something that's important to us, we want to give it away. We have that DNA because God's nature is generous. Ephesians 2 says God is rich in mercy. Romans 2 says God is rich in kindness. Romans 11 says God is rich in wisdom. Ephesians 1 says God is rich in grace. Generosity is a natural outflow of a truly grateful heart for what God has done in our lives. It just happens. It happens all through scripture. The woman at the well came face to face with Jesus and through their conversation, she had to run back to the village and tell everyone about him. Zacchaeus came face to face with Jesus when Jesus invited himself to come to dinner and Zacchaeus changed everything about his life for him. 
Jesus healed a man born blind, and the formerly blind man immediately asked the Pharisees if they want to follow Jesus too. The jailer in charge of the apostle Paul experiences Jesus and drops everything he's doing to follow Jesus too and have his whole family baptized. That's the beginning, and we live generation after generation of those who bear witness to a generous God. It just flows out of us to keep our focus. We have to give away our faith. A few years ago, I had a fridge guy come to my house to fix my fridge, and I was studying for my ordination exam, so I had this really big textbook out. And I was in a scenario where I thought to myself, I would like to take this time to read this really deep theological material, or I can talk to this guy. And I chose to talk to the guy because he was talking to me. And I thought, okay, God, I'm listening. I'll put this away. Again, I want to hoard my time, right? So what does it mean to just show up for someone when they're speaking? And as we're talking, this guy, he's like fixing my fridge. And he's like, what are you doing with that book? I said, well, I'm, I'm studying to be a minister. And he said, oh, man, Jesus saved my life. I'm like, oh. He's like, I was addicted. I was lost. I was found by Jesus. I'm like, great. And then he goes on. He's like, yeah, my wife and I were trying to have a kid. And we tried for 10 years. And we did in vitro. And we did everything. And we just, we just gave it up to God. And we, just, we said, we're going to just surrender to you, God, whatever you want for our lives. And two months later, my wife was pregnant. And this is a picture of our baby. And I'm like, this is my fridge guy. This is my fridge guy who is bearing witness to the generosity of God. He's just like, it's just pouring out of him. He's just showing up just embracing his faith. I'm like, you're a guy, you're a missionary. You are a citizen of heaven who goes into people's homes and you bring that peace and that love and that generous nature of God and I didn't want to talk to you because I wanted to read a religious textbook and that's the day I realized that I was a Pharisee. <laughs> but man, when we experience that, we experience that outflow, we just show up and we make time we don't hoard our talent and our treasure. And we, just, we make time. What we experience is that we, we have people who are giving their faith away all around us. And that God is calling us to do the same thing. To keep our focus, we have to give away our faith. Finally, to keep our joy, we have to give away the outcomes. As we consider this idea of giving things away in our life, it can get easy to get lost in making sure that you get the outcome you were expecting especially now that you know that generosity is so good for you. In our sinful hearts, we can easily find a selfish twist in that call to give it away. But the true joy of giving of ourselves has nothing to do with the outcomes. It has everything to do with the act. 2 Corinthians 9 says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There's a story from AA about a recovering addict who had begun to work the 12th step. To keep it, you have to give it away. But when he started doing his 12th step calls on his own, he found he was getting too involved and nobody he was serving was getting sober. His sponsor had a long talk with him to explain that he was trying to save the world, and he needed to remember to carry the message, not the body. You see, God has called us to carry the message. Our generosity is not designed to compel anyone but ourselves. The message of this passage is that the motive behind the act is more important than the act. Yes, God may give us the opportunity to be a part of the way he's reaching someone else. In fact, he definitely will. But we don't give of ourselves about what we're going to get from the other. We just give of ourselves out of joy. Sometimes we're overwhelmed by all we could do, and so we fail to do anything. But it's often in just knowing what our treasure is and taking whatever opportunity is placed in front of us that our true joy is found. After that moment with my fridge guy, a few years later I found myself on a plane, another opportunity to be generous or not. And I had a conversation with the guy next to me on the plane. It was very interesting because he was a doctor, he was a surgeon, and he worked in the ICU. So he was mostly around death. 
And so we talked about this a little bit, and I thought, oh, look, this is an opportunity. Like, this is a, per- I mean, if we're going to talk about life and death, this is where God's going to give me an opportunity to, to really start a conversation. And I'm thinking, God, isn't it cool that I showed up for this guy? Because I didn't want to, you know? And so we're talking, and I say to him, yeah, um, he asked me finally what I do, and I said, I'm a pastor, actually, so I'm actually around life and death quite a bit as well. And he was like, oh, I'm an atheist, and then just started reading his book again. <laughs> And I don't know what that did in his life because it's not about what the outcomes are. You see, the way God shows up for us is he will give you the when, he will give you the what, and he will give you the who, but he may not give you the why. When God calls us to be generous, when you feel that Holy Spirit nudge that says, hey, why don't you talk to your driver? Or hey, you know what, why don't you give more generously than you were thinking you wanted to. Hey, why don't you give of your energy on this Saturday morning when really all you wanna do is watch the game? Hey, when you get that nudge, the spirit will give you the what, it'll give you the, the when, it'll give you the who, but you often don't get the why. We're not in the business of the why. We're in the business of just keeping it by giving it away, keeping it by giving it away. That's what God is calling us to do. Remember the Airbnb from the beginning of the message? Javier and Alejandra just showed up and were generous with their lives. Well, here's what happened. The writer who had the heart attack, who wrote the review, as it turns out, Javier, the host, was actually no stranger to medical emergencies because he had been diagnosed with kidney disease and he traveled abroad frequently and he often had to undergo like dialysis while he was traveling. So he had created an app that helped travelers connect to places to get help, medical help, while they were traveling. And after this review was written, it it made its way up to an Airbnb co-founder who flew down to meet with Javier and Alejandro and ended up funding his app, which now reaches 250,000 people around the world who are connected to medical help they need, all because of one act of generosity. You see, we do and we give because God calls us to be people who do and give. We do and we give because it's an outward sign of an inward reality, but also it's an outward reality that can become an inward sign. God gives us the ability to keep our joy, to keep our focus, to keep our real treasure by giving it away. In small and big ways, we devote ourselves to a generous way of living, and it reflects our abundant and generous God. We have a secure hope and a treasure that can never perish, spoil, or fade, 1 Peter. We have a certain hope in God because God does not fluctuate like the stock market or the political climate or your org chart. God is steady and stable and abundant, and his generosity provides for us over and over again. He keeps giving it so we can keep giving it away. So there's one question for me as our practical step as we end this this day One kind of practical step that can help. And here it is. This is the question. What would it be like to be generous right now? What's the generous thing to do? That's just a very simple thought. When you go to work, when you're with your family, stopping and saying, what's the generous thing to do right now? When you ask yourself that question, God's going to provide opportunities. It's not every opportunity. It's not every time. But there's times where we're opened up to say, this is a place where I've been called to give it away. And that is how we experience joy. So here's a question one. What do you think your treasure is that you are likely to hold on to tightly? That's your first question. What's the treasure that you're likely to hold on to? Is it your time, your skills, your connection, your money, your mercy, your energy? What treasure is the hardest for you to let go? And then this week, with that treasure in mind, when you are presented with an opportunity to give that treasure freely and cheerfully, because you will be, here's the question to ask. What would be the generous thing to do right now? And then do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are our generous God. You are rich in mercy for each one of us. You are abundant in grace for each one of us. You have captured our hearts. You have rescued us from our sin. You have given us a way to live with a new place to belong and a new citizenship. And God, you've called us to be people who are just giving that away. So we ask you, God, that you would open us up to see the ways that we might want to hold tightly to a treasure that you have freely given. And would you help us to open our hands and begin to give it away? What would be the generous thing to do right now? 
and give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us this week on Menlo Church Online. Our hope this week is that this message both inspired you and helped you connect to God better. We also hope that you have several questions coming out of this week. And so if that's the case, please shoot us a note at menlo.church. And we hope to see you next week.